This episode of the Model 3 Owners Club podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage on your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1-855-385-4226 or visit our website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Welcome again to another edition of the Model 3 Owners Club podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page. I'm joined by Ian Falco and Mr. Eric Camacho. How are you doing, boys? Nice to see you again. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, listen, if you guys are new to the channel or new to the podcast, welcome. Uh, you know, Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel because, hey, we put out a, a podcast just about every week and some other videos, too. I got some other stuff that's happening next week. So, uh, yeah, get in on that. Listen, we got a lot to talk about tonight. I want to thank uh, everybody earlier today who submitted questions because we're going to try and make this an, uh, a regular thing every time we do the podcast. So we have some excellent questions. We'll do that a little bit later in the show. But tonight's headline is all about Model 3 configurations finally opening in Europe. Yay. It's finally <laughs> happened. Yes, Very nice. As, yes. As early as uh, yesterday morning, I was starting to get um, some intel uh, through private channels on Twitter that uh, Tesla had updated some of the European sites with expectations as far as configurations were concerned. And very shortly after that, I started getting a flood of uh, contacts and private tweets. Um, and it was all over Twitter, of course, that the configurator emails had started going out to uh, to uh, to some people in Europe. Now, specifically, there are a, f a handful of countries that can configure now, and it uh, includes the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and France. Tesla just recently answered someone on Twitter today because they'd asked them specifically about Germany, and they said that Germany and some of the other countries will be coming online in the next few weeks. So that's very exciting. So it's finally rolling out. Um, Want to mention too, again, these are for left-hand drive cars. There are no right-hand drive cars, so the UK is going to have to wait until probably at least still um, middle of 2016 before we see those cars. But it's very encouraging, and everybody is like crazy over the moon about this. Um, the timing works out well because Elon had previously said that they were looking at uh, production starting in January, delivery starting in February. Uh, there's always a lead time in there, and I, we always kind of speculated that uh, this would probably happen in December, and lo and behold, here we are. So congratulations to everybody who's listening or watching in Europe that uh, you finally got your chance to configure your Model 3. By the way, I want to put out a little note to say that uh, just like North America, uh, not all the emails have gone out to everyone yet. Um, I've been told that the configuration order is going out in reservation order. So, it, But it can't hurt to check your Tesla account just like happened uh, here in North America. A lot of people didn't get the email and lo and behold went into your Tesla account and they had the configure button. So can't hurt if you're in those countries, go in and click and see if you can configure your car. Um, the other thing too is only the um, long range and the performance model are available if I remember correctly, let's just take a look here. I got some pictures here that someone had sent me from uh, from France. Uh, some of these are prices are, look a little high, but keep in mind that in Europe, typically prices are inclusive of the VAT, value added tax. So uh, unlike North America, where everything is priced outside of tax. So yeah, we're looking at, um, and I can't read this because I don't have my glasses on again. Gosh, I, I really got to, <laughs> I'll learn. What, you want the, uh, the prices? Yeah, I'm just going to bring it up here a little bit. So here we go. So there, yeah, I was going to say, I can help you there. So, so, there's, the, long, um, yeah, so there's long range in the performance cars. Some right. people were asking on Twitter if we were going to see the medium range car. And the answer is we don't really know. Um, I have a feeling, this is just personal opinion right now. Here, I'll just bring up some more pictures here. So here's the... Uh, What's, uh, what's this one here? Yeah, here's your colors and your options and stuff. Um, I have a feeling the mid-range right now is going to be probably a North American exclusive, and it's a bit of a stopgap until they can get the standard range car available. That's just my personal opinion. I don't have inside information on this yet. Um, they did say that uh, standard range was going to start, hopefully, production early in the spring. So, uh, you know, I think the mid-range is probably just a uh, little bit of a stopgap until that car becomes available. At that point, who knows what's going to happen. Um, yeah. So what are your thoughts, guys? I mean, pretty exciting times for a lot of these people are looking at uh, finally getting their chance to order these cars. 
Yeah, it's really great. I mean, we've talked in the show in the past about people in the U.S. going, where's my car? And we're like, do you understand what Australia, Europe, and Asia has been waiting for for all this time? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's great that we're starting to see uh, orders coming in through. Uh, we've seen a lot of folks on Twitter uh, just in the last 24 hours post their images of their notifications on their emails or just going to their uh, configurator. So it's it's a really great time for them. We're so excited. So if you are listening to us overseas uh, in the European market, just know that we here uh, in North America are extremely happy for you. We can't wait to see you guys get your cars. Um, you know, and for those that you mentioned are waiting for the right hand cars. It's a little longer wait for them, but uh, we know Tesla's mentioned that those will be coming sometime uh, in the, I think the middle of next year is what they uh, said might be might be going on. Yep. Um, so yeah, so it's it's great. We're you know for those who are waiting for it so long, I mean we we always knew it was going to be sort of like early to mid 2019, and now that we're in December, uh, we're you know 2019 is around the corner, so that orders are now being process now deliveries will be hopefully coming in this in february or so uh, of next year so it's just a matter of weeks after all this time waiting for them so it's uh, it's a great time to be in europe super super exciting <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> i've been i <laughs> really been tagged literally all day um both publicly and privately everybody's super excited i finally got my order in i'm so excited so yeah um yeah so uh, really looking forward to that i i know some other people have had been asking um uh, what was the other thing too? Oh, they were asking about referral codes. Um, I've done some preliminary investigation. I've tried this. Uh, referral codes don't seem to work for Europe. So um, unless you have a European referral code, I don't know. I tried using mine just to see if it was coming up and it does it. It only seems if you use somebody's referral code at this point, as, you know, barring, I mean, any other investigation, I've only looked at mine. Um, it only works at the, the uh, you only see Model S and Model X. So mm -hmm. There's two things that could be in play here, and I don't know which one's which. It could be one of two things. One, it could be that much like North America, referral codes didn't work on the Model 3 uh, initially. Mm -hmm. um, it took several months before that even opened up. Matter of fact, I think it was only started in June with the advent of the Performance Model 3. So that could be Actually, one place. Later than that, Trev, it was... Uh they weren't even active. I placed my order June 26th and they still weren't active. It was around August 1st, I think. I, came I think so. I think it was sometime okay. in August. I'm, I'm yeah, corrected. Right. So we'll call it August. So that could be one possibility that they just don't want to deal with that quite yet. Or it could be that the current referral program that's in place officially ends uh, on December 10th, which is this coming Monday. And they wouldn't want to introduce referral codes just to take them away or that privilege to be taken away uh, quite so soon. That would upset a lot uh, of people. That would make sense. Right? So that's a possibility there. So barring any other possibilities, that could be what's going on. Again, I've only tried with mine or a couple other people's referral codes that I know of. They only happen to be in North America. I don't know if it requires a European referral code to make that work. Referral codes so far, from my understanding, have always been international. You can use anybody's. Um, so one of those two things. So some people have been um, asking me, it says, oh, I tried to use a referral code and it's not working. I said, well, I don't know what the deal is. So that's why I went and investigated. So if you're trying to use a referral code on Model 3 so far, it doesn't seem to be working. It's, it's something also, because uh, this happened here in the US, sometimes you have to go to work with a Tesla owner advisor or somebody who's in a Tesla showroom to have them apply the code to your order. It may not be something the customer could do on their end. That's, that's um, correct. You could probably, there's always the possibility and you could always ask them after the fact if you can add it before right. you take delivery. So if you have an issue and mm -hmm. you can't use one, it doesn't hurt to go down to your local Tesla showroom whatever, and just ask a local advisor and see if they can actually put the request in manually in the system. So if you're looking right. for that, yeah, can't be worth a, could be worth a try. If you want somebody's referral code, well, we've got some down in the video description or the podcast description. You can use one of those. So, well, pretty exciting times. Wow. Uh, now we're just going to wait for uh, China. China will be next, I suspect, uh, based on this particular timing and what Tesla had said that they were going to start deliveries probably March, but most definitely in April. I would expect um, the configurator to open up in China in January. So not much longer. Mm -hmm. And then um, we'll see what happens for Australia. But Australia and, of course, the UK being right-hand drive, uh, again, that'll be second half of 2019 for those. So still exciting times. Um, but oh, also yeah. the other thing, too, I got a lot of tweets from um, people in London because they finally had one um, being on display. They brought one into London, and those stores were just completely packed. So uh, they're certainly um, – the, the fact that they're bringing them to those right-hand drive countries to at least display, and of course, they're American cars. But at, uh, at least people get a chance to sit in the car, and uh, people are loving it so far. So – it's all yeah. exciting. Excellent. Well, um, the other uh, bit of news is that there was a video that was put out 
by The Verge this week, and they did a tour of the Gigafactory Nevada. And there was some interesting information that came out of that, because at one point they interviewed uh, a gentleman who, I'm going to run the video here, you're not going to hear anything, but I'll let you, I'll just talk over this and you guys can watch the video if you happen to be on uh, on YouTube. I apologize for those of you who are on the audio version of the podcast who can't see, so I encourage you to go look at the uh, at the um, at the at our podcast on YouTube, or um, you know, I'll put a link to the uh, to the video. You can watch it on your own there too. But anyway, so they were interviewing this gentleman. His name is Chris Lister, and uh, they were asking him about uh, you know the possibility of what's going to happen with the Gigafactory, and he basically insinuated that. Uh, They'll be building other products there, of course, you know, more uh, energy products, um, some other stuff. But basically, my takeaway from this is that obviously, and we've been saying this for some time now, that's where Model Y is really going to be built, uh, possibly even this, uh, the, the new Roadster and the semi-truck. Because let's face it, there's no more room in, in Fremont. We know this. Um, there's lots of room in the desert. They've moved that. Uh, they built a new parking lot to the north side because uh, the parking lot where the Gigafactory is right now is uh, currently occupied by cars, and eventually that's going to be turned into um, some of the rest of the factory in due time. So yeah, I think uh, you know it, <laughs> it's funny how he says it. He's basically insinuating, well, you know, other products and, and future products. So. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's really what's going to be uh, where that's going. The other thing too, I mean, the other bit of evidence, and we've talked about this many times before, the fact that Tesla has not announced any other factories for North America for this new car. Basically, I mean, it's the Gigafactory. It just makes total sense. Uh, some people are saying, well, what about the Gigafactory in China? Well, that factory is just for the Asian market, and that factory. Um, is supposed to start coming online by the middle part of next year. So some of you are probably saying, well, are they going to be able to build a factory that fast? Well, uh, the Chinese market sometimes moves very quickly. Uh, so it seems to be a little bit less uh, bureaucratic red tape over there. But I also think <laughs> that all the stuff that they've learned from the Model 3 production line, and specifically GA4, also known as the tent, uh, could be built there very quickly, import parts, start building the cars. I mean, we mentioned this on the podcast before, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty exciting. What do you guys think? Um, have you seen the video? Did you get a chance to check it out? I mean, I, I was just going to say that clip that you just showed actually was all footage from Fremont. So um, I, I haven't watched the whole video, but I assume they're they're doing part of it in Fremont, and then part of it was probably yeah. Shot here, I'll put up the I'll put up this video again. This is the Gigafactory itself, so you can ah, see the drivetrains. Okay. Yeah, sorry yeah, about that. So there's a Model Three yeah. battery pack. Yep. Um, the drivetrains, the cells. That's um, that's Fremont there. So Definitely. they've intermixed some of the clips. I'm sorry about that. Yes, they've intermixed some of the clips and stuff. So I'll just mm -hmm. take. Okay. No, I just I didn't want to confuse anybody who's watching the footage and thinking, wait a second, are they already building cars there? Whoa. Yeah. So well, they did. Yeah. But, well, they went to the Gigafactory and they also uh, went to Fremont. So like I said, they've they've intermixed some of the clips and stuff. But uh, right. Yeah. Pretty interesting things. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it goes – what you're saying, like, it's not surprising given the size of, of the factory and how <laughs> it's ever expanding. Um, you know, the, the roof – I mean, we talked on a podcast, I think it was a couple of months ago, just about the amount of solar energy they have on the roof of the Gigafactory. So it's a, it's a really large facility. Uh, I think it's rivaled by the um, – uh, at Kennedy Space Center, the vehicle, the vehicle assembly building oh, yeah, in terms of overall volume. Um so it, I mean, look, it's it's it sort of doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's what they're going to eventually do. Um, well, don't forget, but yeah, it's, Elon it's, and his team down there, SpaceX, are rocket scientists. So I mean, there's some intermixing <laughs> going on. <laughs> but in, ter in terms of deducing that the yeah, Giga yeah. Factory One is large enough that they go, well, you could probably add some assembly lines here beyond just battery packs and whatnot. So uh, it's it's good to see because I think you know we're we're aware of Fremont sort of extended its reach with the four assembly lines now. And uh, for them to sort of have a, a framework, a blueprint as far as what to do moving forward, uh, whether it's in Gigafactory 1 or Gigafactory 3 when it's built in China, uh, it's, uh, it's good to see that they're able to expand quickly and hopefully get production ramped up uh, in a very short time. Yeah, my, my feeling, and I would hope all things being equal, that in order to get this Model Y production up, and there was a report uh, by uh, Bloomberg that came out. They said that they had some internal leaked documents or whatever that Tesla didn't refute, um, but they did say that the timelines had since changed. But basically, they were insinuating right. that Model Y was going to be ramped 
um, brought up online very quickly, and, and it, was, it was specifically mentioned it would be the Gigafactory. So mm-hmm. we kind of figured that it doesn't take too much to put two and two together to figure out that's what's going on. But yeah. all things being equal, everything that they've learned from the Model 3 ramp, which was extremely painful, Elon is uh, not remiss to remind everyone about how much pain they went through <laughs> that to get that going. Yeah. I, I would really hope, and Tesla is one of those companies that sometimes they sometimes they learn, sometimes they make silly mistakes and they keep shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, my hope is don't reinvent the wheel. Take what you've learned from the Model 3 production, copy and paste. Like take all that production. You've you've got the thing. It's running. It's making six, 7,000 cars a week, right? Uh, well, maybe not 7,000, but let's let's call it 6,000 cars, okay? Well, it's speaking out apparently some days at around that. Yeah. Well, let's just call it 6,000, okay? Copy and paste that thing. <laughs> just, yes. Like don't reinvent <laughs> the wheel. Like keep working on your automation where it makes sense. But, you know, you want to get this car in the market, just copy and paste what you've already done. Like, just put it over there. <laughs> I'll I'll be curious to see what they do. Um, one of the technologies they talked about improving going into Y was the wiring harness. I remember that was about over a year ago, I yes. think. They talked about r- dramatically reducing the amount of wiring. Um, that might have been uh, also due to the fact that they were talking at some point of giving the Y its own platform. I know, thank God, it sounds like all the engineers have talked Elon out of doing that, and it's it's since been confirmed it's going to be a Model 3 platform. But I wouldn't be surprised if they did something a little bit with the wiring to, uh, to sort of trim it down. Well, they were really shooting for some low number in terms of the actual amount of wiring needed. You to, have to remember that, you know, Elon had been talking about Model Y originally. I mean, there was a tweet, uh, and I had a copy of it, and I don't have it here in front of me. Uh, he was insinuating that, uh, you know, this was before the Model 3 was actually released. Somebody had asked him about Falcon Wing Doors, and he says, well, there's a Model 3 and a Model Y, and one of those two cars will have it. Look, I don't think there's going to be anything fancy uh, as far as doors are concerned on the Model Y. That's really relegated for Model X. Um, they want to get this car onto the market as quick as possible. Elon said that the board of directors talked them off the precipice of doing something really silly as far as Model Y. Yeah. So they've decided to really reuse a lot of Model 3 technology, which makes perfect sense. Look, the rest of the yeah. industry does this. There's no reason why Tesla has to do everything bespoke all the time. Take the Model yeah. 3 tech, take the battery pack, the drivetrain, the electronics, Stretch the body, uh, stretch the platform if you have to a little bit. Throw uh, throw an SUV body on it. Throw some extra yeah. stuff in there because you know it is Tesla. They're going to do something innovative with the car, whether it's a wiring harness or something visual. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Guaranteed, they will do something unique for the car. But like I said, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. You got to get this thing on the market as soon as possible. Um, reuse the technology. Uh, spend the time on doing something else crazy. I mean, I think that you know the fact that Elon is talking so much more about the pickup truck really indicates that. Largely, Model Y is is almost baked and done, and um, now they can move on to something new and exciting and uh, and buy themselves some time. Um, they need the money, so if they can keep producing Model uh, Three and Model Y for the next three or four years before we even see another product, it won't be the end of the world. Uh, there's other things coming. I mean, Roadster, um, semi truck, those are largely very low volume vehicles. I mean, probably mm-hmm. semi truck probably around twenty thousand cars a year. Roadster might be twenty five hundred cars a year. I mean, we're very expensive vehicles. Um, so yeah, we're not talking Model Three type of volume for those cars. So there's no reason for them to be able to do you know a product every year and keep ramping up and stuff. Not to say that they don't yeah. have their products in the pipeline. But I think profitability is more important. So if you can just keep iterating on what you're currently doing right now and a product refresh on the SNX in, in a couple of years, which has been insinuated, hey, you're, you're set for the next four years. I think there's Model nothing wrong with that. Model 3 convertible. Uh, well, no, that's the Roadster. <laughs> no, yeah, but no, that mere mortals can afford, you know, like. Well, true. Yes, there's there's room for everything. But, you know, if you learn anything about Tesla, it's it's always iterative in a lot of ways, and they don't try to mix up mix things up. I mean, one of the other uh, things that has just recently happened, of course, and we talked about this last time, is the recent changes on the Model S configuration. I mean, there's no sunroof anymore; it's just all glass, mm-hmm. right? And introducing yet another variant of the Model Three with other features and stuff. Just personally, overall, this doesn't make really sense. Uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, no, they, they got a long way to go to exploit volume and really get cars to market before they could start building that. You know, I the thing is, I come from the German car mindset, having driven Audis for so many years, where there's a zillion variants. Oh, you know, yeah. Like just the A4 platform, you know, you have the sport backs and you have the coupes, which is the A5, and then you have the convertible version. When you look at the X-Series da, 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 da. from BMW, I mean. Same thing. You know, yeah, started I mean, the X5, yeah. and now they have a one, yeah. a two, a three, a four, five, a six, a seven. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and Tesla's going the completely opposite direction. It's like, let's have very high volume for the first few years of very few models, which is what they need. Uh, I mean, if, if your goal is to get as many um, vehicles converted, you know, as much EV adoption as possible, don't come out with 16 different models and complicate your well, life. Well, the last thing we need is for Tesla to become another GM and change just the door handles and call it another model. Right. We really don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that. I don't want Tesla to be like that. Like, keep innovating, uh, do some interesting stuff, but uh, when know when to say no, and just focus and uh, stay profitable above all else. Because last thing we need is, uh, yes. is more bad news. I'm tired of that. Keep mm-hmm. it simple, stupid. That's right, baby. Correct. Yes. Anyhow, uh, let's move on and less a little bit. Uh, some of you probably know this already. The uh, Model Three now has a roof rack. Here it is. Ta-da. Uh, you know, this was uh, speculated for like the longest time. What's going on with the roof rack? Um, I, you know, when Ken and I had done the video, oh gosh, it was last September when we had a early VIN number of a Model 3. We found uh, what appeared to be the attachment points. And of course, this is confirmed now of where the roof rack attaches. They were just little metal tabs underneath the rubber um, uh, rubber seal there along the rain gutters on the, on the top of the roof. But since then, not a word, not a peep out of Tesla. Anyhow, um, four hundred fifty dollars US instantly sold out. <laughs> no possibility of back order. <laughs> so uh, yeah, if you want a uh, if you want a, a a bike rack or some kind of roof rack, well, uh, who knows what's going to happen? Um, I don't know who makes this uh, for Tesla. Tesla does not make this. I'm sure they don't. They farm it out to someone else. Probably is Thule, Yakima, one of those two companies um, along those lines. But my my guess is probably Thule makes them for that. Uh, makes it for them. But uh, load rating, 150 pounds, um, aluminum crossbars, so you can put ski racks, bike racks, cargo boxes, that type of thing. For those of you who um, really want something like this and maybe you're a little frustrated you can't get them, check out seasucker.com, S-E-A sucker.com. Those are the, uh, the suction cup ones. They uh, mount onto the glass. Um, very reliable. Um, I have one of those that I use for my expensive camera and never fallen off. 14 pounds per square inch at sea level is pretty, uh, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty good uh, downforce to hold things onto the car. So I, I trust them and uh, they work well. And um, eh, the cost is probably about the same. So anyhow. And, uh, be, and this is also a good lesson for us all. Like the surfboards that came before it, these roof <laughs> racks. Like oftentimes when something is on that website, it's usually not on there for very long. Yeah. Well, I mean. And this is one of the questions we have a little bit later, but you know, if if Tesla was to offer a finally a hitch, uh, it would be instantly sold out. So the uh, moral oh. of the story: if you see an accessory for Model Three that's immediately available and you want it, don't wait. Order yeah, it, buy it, order it <laughs> right away. Um, I also got which a report. Really, which really is the lesson we've been telling people, even when it comes to getting the car, is like if you're thinking about getting it with the tax credit or whatever it is, like don't wait. Like if you see yeah. something available, get it Lord. now because it could. You could go to sleep tonight and tomorrow the configurator is different, or they've added a feature, they've removed an option. Like if you know it's there and you want to get it, just get it. <laughs> the, don't delay. The, the we've, lear- <laughs> we've learned this lesson too many times to, to, to repeat it. Same thing with wheels. If you want winter wheels, don't wait. Uh, they're constrained on those. Uh, if you want a surfboard, yeah. buy the surfboard. I mean, the surfboard's gone right. now, but any of those things, if you like them, uh, tchotchkes, that type of thing, because what Tesla giveth, sometimes Tesla will taketh. And the same goes for third-party manufacturing products. I mean, we we did a show where we highlighted some products here for the holidays. I know our friend Michael did some on his yep. Tesla Tunity channel. Uh, you know, those suppliers oftentimes don't have a ton of stuff. One of our sponsors, uh, Evanex, they oftentimes will run out of a product mm-hmm. and there's great demand for it. So if you see something online, if you want to get it, don't wait, just get the product. And you'd rather have it early than not get it at all. That's right. Well, the holiday seasons are coming. So, you know, I've been doing, yeah. I've been doing a little shopping on Amazon here and I'm expecting a delivery any minute. So if you hear the doorbell, you know what's coming. And it's not for me, it's for Miss <laughs> Daisy upstairs. <laughs> Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. 
All right. Well, we've been talking for uh, 35, 36 minutes on this stuff. Um, I think it's time for us to get into some uh, viewer submitted questions, which is uh, fast becoming my favorite part of the show because, hey, we like to spread the knowledge a little bit. So we have, uh, oh gosh, um, probably about 10 questions or whatever. So we're going to try and get through this as best we can. So the first question comes from Mr. James Connolly on Twitter. He says, uh, could the Model 3 use active noise cancellation to reduce wind and road noise? Also, is the Model 3 scheduled to get air suspension at some point? Excellent, excellent questions. You know what? Mm -hmm. The active noise cancellation, I don't see any reason why they couldn't. They have enough microphones in the car. They have enough processing power. Um, I mean, processing power is not um, something that the Model 3 is any slouch at. I have a set of headphones upstairs that have a microchip that does it, and it works extremely well. Um, how uh, useful would that be? I mean, if you're canceling too much noise out at low speed, then you may not hear other cars or pedestrians or something. So there might be some ramifications. I don't see any reason why they couldn't do that. Um, is that something you guys would like to see in the car? What do you think? I, it'd be cool to see it attempted. I mean, maybe under certain circumstances. Uh, to your point, Trev, if we worried about uh, ambient noise cancellation at low speeds interfering, you know, as a safety issue, um, you could just activate it at high speeds. Because let's face well, it, true. you know, uh, road noise and, and wind noise aren't really a big factor at, you know, 20, 30, 40 miles an hour. Yeah, I agree it's with when you. you get up. You get up at higher speeds, and uh, I, I know now that I've got a different set of winter tires on that are a little bit noisier, it'd be fun to dial out some of the noise. It's very minor, but, you know, you you do get super OCD about noise in this car because it's so quiet to begin <laughs> with. So it would be cool to see them experiment with it and, and uh, see what could be done. Yeah, I don't I don't doubt I, that they would do it. Uh, my Lincoln had it, and it, and it worked. Eric, you were going to say something? I was just saying, I mean, I would want to see it too, because I, my experience driving here in Florida uh, and the roads here are have a different sort of asphalt. They are a mixture of asphalt and seashells. Oh, so right. the seashells add a substantial amount of road noise on our all-season tires. Yeah. So on my on my vehicle, especially because the Model 3 has less uh, sound buffering than, say, the more premium S and X models, um, it's very difficult sometimes for people to hear me on my Bluetooth phone. So the calls are, I have to talk louder or they can't hear me. So I use things like my wonderful AirPods to actually have to make a call. Uh, so I think I think for, to that, to that extent, if, if it's triggered by the software where once your vehicle's at a certain speed, maybe it can automatically be engaged or just give us the option to turn it on and off. But I would probably use it more often than not just because I drive on Florida roads all the time in those conditions. Well, just to your point, because you mentioned Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth and the Teslas, as far as audio quality, is the pits. <laughs> um, yeah, Bjorn even P did. P-I-T-S, by the way, folks. He said pit, as in like a peach pit. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, it's not good at all. Um, Bjorn actually, Bjorn Nyland, who has an excellent uh, YouTube channel, actually did um, a comparison. Uh, using a, a Plantronics uh, uh, headset uh, and uh, mm -hmm. the Bluetooth in the car, and it yeah, it's it's brutal. So um, yeah, <laughs> that that would use some improvement if if there's possibility. So I think as far as the noise cancellation, I think we need to make maybe a little bit of a concerted uh, Twitter effort maybe to try and get Elon's attention on that. I think it's a I think it's an excellent uh, thing. So uh, James, mm -hmm. thank you very much for sending in that question. We're going to see if yes, what, thank you. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to see if I can get Elon's attention. Maybe just throw that out there. So he has a second point too, because he's asking about the air suspension on the Model 3. I know Elon had mentioned early on, um, 2016, that there would be an option for that. Now, we've always seen that air suspension um, on early days on the Model S was an option. Now it's only, well, actually now it's included on in all the variants of the cars. Mm -hmm. um, right now we haven't seen anything that, uh, as far as that's concerned on the Model 3. I would have thought that it would have been added at some point um, on the performance Model 3, obviously the higher Agreed. specs. Yeah, let me jump in on that one. Um, having watched any tweets on that very, very closely, as you can imagine, <laughs> I uh, I noticed right away when the car was first announced, when the details broke on it um, back in May, largely thanks to Ryan. Yes, uh, Ryan was asking me. about that. <laughs> yeah, he, he got a great amount of information out uh, back in May when, when word started to break on the car. And the air suspension was confirmed that it would be available at some point, uh, and it was estimated to be about a year away. So the car was going to launch without it. Now, um, so that we know that at some point the performance will get it as an option, whether that'll trickle down to the entire lineup, I'd be kind of surprised if it didn't. I mean, I imagine they make a pretty good buck. You know, usually this is the type of item that should be a high profit margin uh, option. So it would be to their advantage to offer it on any of the cars like they do with the, with the S and the X. 
Um, but not long ago, I want to say within the last two months, I thought I saw something else, another tweet, something saying that, yeah, it's still in the works, but it's, it's going to be next year. Hmm. What if they did this? Um, because I've been long saying that I always thought that the option of a metal roof on the Model 3, let's say for the base model of the car, would never really happen. And Tesla's all in on glass. So what okay. if, what if the configuration next year changes the premium package on the car, adds air suspension, and the standard mm-hmm. model retains a glass roof? Hmm. Well, now there's a thought. I don't know. Just spitballing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it could be. Uh, my, my hope was that the volume in this car is so high that they're going to actually allow more configurations over time. Like, I understand why they're keeping things super streamlined at the moment, mm-hmm. but it's the one thing I miss from from some of the other cars that I've owned is, you know, the ability to customize the order to the way you want it. And uh, I would hope as time permits and production hell is finally over and they start to be able to put a little bit of variability into the cars, that you'd be able to pick and choose things that you want. Um, maybe we will, maybe we'll get that. Maybe we won't, but, um, I, I, I would posit that would not happen. And the reason why is we were seeing the changes to the model S and X configurator. I was just about to say the same thing. Yeah. Uh, where it's going the other way. Seen, yeah. it's, it, right. It's going more towards the model three version, uh, of how to configure a car. So we were seeing certain options go as we quote unquote, say it's off menu. Yeah, uh, so yeah. you can still get it from an owner advisor who can work with you on making the, the option change, uh, like the sunroof on a Model S. That was sort of a shock for some people, like, what? I can't get a sunroof now yeah. online? Um, but I think I think for Tesla's production lines, as more and more orders are coming in, especially now with the European market and then soon the Asian market coming online, I think it behooves them to make the options as simple as possible so that it's less confusing for the potential owner because you're not picking from 16 different configuration options. You're really picking from like four. Uh, and it allows them to process the orders more quickly and it streamlines your inventory so that you're having more of one car available versus having a very select few that maybe fit a certain configuration. So I, I, I understand where you're going, Ian, but I, I would I would say until we see anything different, the behavior in the last year has been regressing towards the mean, which is having fewer options, not more. Agreed. Oh, yeah, and, and, and I'm not saying this is something I'd expect to see. I'm, I'm talking a five-year-old goal when they finally, because, I mean, they're gotcha. going to be production constrained for at least four or five years. We know this worldwide. It's going to take a long time to catch up, but... Long term, you know, when I'm looking at buying my next one is, is what I'm thinking. <laughs> the next one's always the next one. <laughs> Road, the Roadster 3.0. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> All right, next next question. We've been talking about this. Uh, let's get into the next one here. Um, on Twitter, Esperiti V. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I didn't hear. He's asking, uh, or I'm assuming it's a he. Any news about mid-range all-wheel drive? When they will they be available to configure? Um, hmm. I think this kind of goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier that I think the Model 3, the mid-range car, is a stopgap until yep. they can get the price down on the standard range, at which point all-wheel drive would basically revert to being either an option on that car or move up um, to the yeah. other ones. Um, again, only Tesla really knows what's going on there. Um I think it's, again, it's another issue about trying to keep things as simple as possible for this production to keep things sustained. Every time you add another option in there, it just complicates matters. So we really don't know. Um, I would like to be able to see basically all the options available in all of the cars. Um, who knows? <laughs> But it is an yeah, excellent I mean, question. I mean, we, you know, there's, there's been some people who have theorized that the mid-range model came out to help uh, satisfy those folks who were in the U.S. who wanted to capitalize on the federal tax credit as it stands yeah, today. Uh, at yes, that was big. That maybe didn't want to get the long-range model starting at like close to $50,000. So the, the mid-range model sort of acclimated to those customers it wasn't a great number but it was still a fair number of folks who said okay that's that's more of a palatable number i can work with that and that market catered to them uh especially as we're starting to see now the euro market come online and their options for the battery with a long range and the performance uh so yeah i i we don't really know it's a great question uh we're certainly just spitballing our idea here um but i would think it's not going to happen is my inclination 
Um, but as Trevor's proved on the show, we are known to be wrong from time to time. <laughs> uh, but again, that that is just our my idea. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it was just more of a stopgap, uh, as Trevor mentioned. Mm-hmm. All right. Next question comes from uh, Aditya Kashik. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I apologize. Um, I want to know if I can pay to get the OEM white seats on my rear wheel drive Model 3. Well, that is a very interesting question. I'm going to say no at this point. Now, Tesla did uh, offer upgraded seats on the Model S um, early on because the original seats were not that great. Um, When they... uh, I think it was the next generation seats. There was a window where some of those people could pay for an upgrade. Now, that was an upgrade mm-hmm. of the whole seat. It wasn't just the material itself. My, my answer to, um, to Aditya would be, if you're really looking for white seats on a real-wheel drive, do what uh, Kim did from the Like Tesla channel and contact T-Sport Line. They are a sponsor of our forum, by the way. So shout out to those guys. Thank you very much. Um, they offer a white fabric. Actually, they have a whole variety of different colors, but they make um, a white uh, fabric replacement set that's almost as good. I think it's pretty close to what Tesla offers. Different design, mind you. They've got the you know the Model 3 lines in it. Uh, it looks pretty good. Um, if you want more information on that, check out uh, Kim, uh, Kim's uh, YouTube channel. They did a whole video on uh, when they bought them and had them installed. They look really great. Um, I'm sure uh, other than replacing the seats, it would be a lot, lot cheaper. Um, I think I was told in Canadian dollars, the upgrade of the next generation seats on a Model S back in the day was upwards of $8,500. So I don't think mm-hmm. you want to spend anywhere near that kind of money, maybe even half of that money just to get the white seats. Um, as you know, yeah, with yeah. anything Tesla, with their options, they're very expensive. Ian, you were going to say something? Yeah, you know what you could do, Trev? I'm throwing this out there. This is a little radical, mm-hmm. but if you could convince a friend who's ordering an all-wheel drive car, to order the white interior and you just order yours black. Supposing that your friend wants a black interior in their car, yeah. you could just swap it all out. I guess. Hopefully it doesn't affect your VIN or your configuration or your warranty. Yeah. And these seats that have would airbags in them and stuff. You got to be careful about that kind of thing. Well, yeah, it's, it's just, it's an amazingly easy job. I mean, I had an A4 and I swapped all of the interior out to the S4 parts. I did it in an evening with a bunch of hand tools. Yeah, it's in not my particularly garage. difficult. No, not at all. I mean, it's uh, it's doable. But to your point, yeah, there might be some warranty concerns there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question comes from uh, my Tesla Dream on Twitter, and a few others, of course, have been asking this because, again, just referencing uh, Kim from the Like Tesla channel, because there was some controversy going on with the Model Three as to what level you should be charging your car. So he says, "What is the optimal charging rate for an older Model X built before 2018? Should it be 70 percent, 80 percent?" Should you charge your car every night, uh, even if you do not put any miles in it? Um, My answer is um, I charge mine to 90% whether the car needs it or not. Um, I have Mm -hmm. not seen any issues with that. Um, I think I have seen maybe, maybe 1% uh, degradation on the battery in 35,000 kilometers. I'm not 100% sure. It could be a battery, uh, uh, a BMS-related um, cycling thing that I have to do. Uh, but literally I charge to 90% without any, really any ill effects. Matter of fact, um, I'm coming up on my one year anniversary on my car. Uh, let's see here. What is today? The sixth. So, uh, yeah, a little less than two weeks and I'm going to do a video on uh, my experiences with the car, uh, which is all positive by the way, but, uh, I'm going to give everybody a little bit of feedback on that. So 90% is the recommended. Anything less than that, you could run into some issues. There is absolutely no issue with leaving the car plugged in. Um, if you live in a colder climate, of course, it's actually good because the battery will cycle and right. pull energy out of the grid to, to keep it warm, preheat. So it doesn't affect your range quite as much in the winter months. So, um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The other thing, too, is uh, do not get in the habit of getting your battery down to 0%. That's very bad. Um, it really throws off the BMS. Matter of fact, the chemistry in the cars is really designed for shorter uh, charge cycles rather than really mm-hmm. long, deep ones. So, uh, yeah, it absolutely does not hurt. Uh, matter of fact, Elon even popped in and said, yeah, he really recommends anywhere from 80 to 90%. I know there was some confusion out there because Tesla's saying different things. But the thing with Tesla sometimes is you'll get different information from different people because not all of them are uh, 100% um, informed on all the things. Matter of fact, Professor Jeff Don, who's under contract at Tesla, basically says the same thing too. Just just keep it topped up. And that way you won't really have any uh, any issues with that. So that's that's what we say. Just just to throw an extra point on that, Trev, uh, when you say going down to zero, I just I want people to know on long trips, don't fear about using the bottom end of the battery. I do believe in that same series of tweets. Tre- um, I've been down to three. Listen. 
Yeah, well, listen, I think, didn't Elon say five? Even five is okay to don't mm-hmm. sweat low single digits, but zero is yeah, bad, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At zero, so, you're, <laughs> there's none. <laughs> don't trust it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and, and that's something, like, ideally, you don't want to go below 20% for your daily commute. But if you are taking a trip, you're certainly going to go below 20% from time to time. Uh, the supercharging routes may even indicate that. Like, okay, well, mm-hmm. you're going to make to this destination. You're going to have like 7% left. Not a big deal. You're going to charge the car once you arrive at that destination as soon as you can. Um, right. And when you're there, if you had it, for example, charging to 100% for that trip, just drop it right back down to your 80 or 90%. Charge up and you're good to go. Uh, but yeah, if you're preconditioning your vehicles in colder climates, which we here in Florida generally do not have, uh, it's always good to leave your car plugged in. If you drove five miles or 200 miles in that Model X, every day just plug that car in and the car will be very happy. By the way, I should mention, um, I have been in the habit right since day one. I leave my indicator on my screen at uh, percentage. I do not use rated miles rated kilometers mm-hmm. I, re, I i that's the way my cell phone is uh, that's what i'm used to uh, literally for me it, it erased any issues with range anxiety i don't look at the numbers i don't think about it all i know is when i hit about 20 percent, i have I, roughly i know how much range i have and at that point mm-hmm. i just look for a charger um if you're going on longer trips now that the energy graph is available in the model 3 use that instead it's much much more accurate and it'll give yeah. you better feedback as far as that's concerned but it literally if you switch it to percentage mode and stop looking at miles or kilometers, uh, you'll find a lot of that stuff kind of goes away. I think the, the problem is, is that most of the cars are being delivered and they're in that mode and they're not instructed to switch it to the other mode. People don't even know it's there. And uh, yeah. I just found that it's, it's. I, I have no range anxiety if you do that. So that's just my recommendation. You do what you want, but that's the way I operate. And I want to quickly add here if I can. So I just mm-hmm. eclipsed 10,000 miles driven oh, on my Model 3. Nice. Uh, and I've had the car since late April. So it's been about seven and a half months uh, that I've had the car. And so far, I've had zero degradation on my batteries. And I charge the car to 90%. Perfect. Well, there you go. Everyone's experience is a bit different. I know Michael on his <laughs> channel. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> Your mileage, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Why am I? Uh, but no, I know some people have said they've already seen 1% already this year for Model 3 owners. Um, but so far, I've had zero. But again, I charge my car to 90%. Just because I'm not able to charge at home all the time, so I want the extra mileage in case I need it. Uh, but again, your your situations will vary, and especially since you're asking about a 2018 and older Model X. But yeah, as long as you're uh, as long as you're charging to 80 90 percent every day, you're 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 doing fine. The batteries are great. Don't worry about it. All right, next question yeah. comes from Carlo on Twitter. He says, "Trevor, well, anybody uh, really noticing a drop in regen after changing my all season tires to the winters? Can you touch upon this? Well, we have in the past, but the Ian, hey, this is your Ballywick. You tell the uh, you tell Carlo what you think about the the regen situation." Just to reiterate, because you talked about it last time. Yeah, I'll keep it real short. Um, But essentially, this is a known issue. Uh, Ever since the winter season started this year, we've seen all sorts of people chiming in on this. There's a huge thread on the forum on it. And uh, I'll be the first to admit, I'm remiss. I haven't been following that for the last week. So I don't know if there's any new developments. But the minute people started putting on winter tires with lower speed ratings, so typically H or T rated tires, they started getting this issue where the regen was dropping out. And it has to do with the fact that these lower speed rated winter tires have more mobile treads. The treads are kind of looser, what we call squirmier. So what happens is when you back off the accelerator, the car goes to regen and it detects this sort of little squirm in the tread and it gets thrown off and thinks, oh, I'm losing traction. And the first thing it does is it backs off the regen so as to not cause the car to skid. Um, That seems to be the fault mode. Now, Tesla has since been very active in collecting data. They encourage anyone who's experienced this to get in touch with their service centers, report the tires that you're using and the experience uh, that you have with it so that they can sort of track it. And they're apparently trying to work on a fix. Um, I'm a little surprised that they haven't been able to come up with something just yet. Um, The one thing I should also mention is it only seems to uh, affect the rear-wheel drive cars. Uh, if you've got a dual motor or a performance, um, there's no problem. I've been running a bunch of different tires on mine, and there's like zero issues. They they work perfectly normally. There's no issues at all with the regen. But on a rear-wheel drive, if you're using uh, a softer, lower-speed-rated tire, this is a problem for now. I, I fully expect that Tesla will come up with something um, to resolve it, hopefully soon. Don't confuse two issues, though. There's There's an issue with the winter tire being the cause of it. And also anytime you have cold temps and you haven't preconditioned the battery, of course, that's going to affect the regen too. So sometimes it's one on top of the other. Sometimes it's just one issue. Sometimes it's just the tires. Cool. 
Next question comes from Brian Stone. He says, can you manually open the car door from the exterior if the battery dies or fails? I understand you can jump the battery or smash the window. Well, I don't recommend smashing the window. <laughs> um, I'm going to assume, Brian, you're asking about the main battery pack because as long as the 12-volt battery that's in the car, yes, there is a way um, that you can open the windows um, uh, the doors, there's an unlock mechanism, there's a spot, I know on my Model X there's a spot where you can put the key fob down by the bottom of the driver's side B pillar along the little plastic cladding, there's a, there's a, in the manual it shows you there's an antenna in there, if you just put the, the key fob on there it unlocks the doors. On the Model 3, I'm sure there's a spot, it might even be, I think on the Model S there was an antenna located by the VIN number plate or it could have been the other side, I forget. Check your user manual, there's a place where you can put uh, key fobs or key cards um, to unlock those uh, the things. Now, again, if your 12 volt battery dies, well, <laughs> that's a different animal altogether. You can get into the front if you pull the um, the cap off the front bumper. There's a lanyard you can pull um, that allows you to open the front trunk so you can get at the 12 volt battery to jump it. But yeah, I don't recommend you go smashing any windows. Definitely yeah, if, if your 12 if your 12 volt battery has power, you can always open the car door with your phone. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to assume or, that's what he's or, talking. Or your card key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, if you have if you happen to have a key fob, or if your key fob is dead, but you can always you can always use your, your cell phone to open your car. Yeah. Also, if you also have trouble too, you can always call Tesla because they have a remote connection into the car, and they can probably mm -hmm. pop it remotely too. So there's that That's opportunity too. Okay, next one comes from David uh, Davin Yang. He says, "Are there any tricks?" Oh boy, this one. I'm sorry about this one. <laughs> Um, he says, if there's any tricks in booking an appointment for service, there are some folks in Ottawa, we're talking about Canada here, they're pretty frustrated with the Montreal service not responding to emails or phone calls. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say about this. Uh, the Tesla service situation is, if you live in an area where there's no Tesla service, it can be really difficult um, getting replies. Uh, I mean, in the case of Ottawa, they send out a ranger. Um, to deal with your issues, um, or you have to drive to Montreal, which is what? It's about an hour and a half, almost two-hour drive, uh, Ian. Is that what it is, the distance between the two? Downtown to downtown, yeah, about two hours. Yeah, about two hours. Okay. I understand. I feel for you. It is frustrating um, sometimes to get – I mean, Tesla service has always been really good to me. When you when you get an appointment, they've been – you know, they bend over backwards. I will say this, and, and this is not an unknown thing in the Tesla community. Tesla's communication needs a lot of work. Um they, uh, you know, if you place an order with a car, if you deal with service, um, they're not always good at responding uh, with emails on time or phone calls. It's just, I'm going to chalk it up to growing pains. They just don't have enough staff sometimes. Uh, things get lost in the mail or whatever the case may be. I would suggest you just keep trying. Get a hold of them. Um, if you can, try to get somebody's number. Uh, befriend somebody. That's that's helped. That's helped with me sometimes. I most I know most of the service people. Um, they're all very friendly people. They love their jobs. But I feel for you. Um, you know, like I said, if you don't live in a in an area that already has a service center, you are going to have some issues. It's just one of those things you have to be prepared. Remember, Tesla does not operate uh, does not operate franchises, so you can't just go to the local shop and get something fixed. It all has to be done through Tesla. So that is. Sometimes um, an Achilles heel as far as service is concerned. Now, they have made uh, a lot of announcements as far as growing their service fleet. And and they, were, they seem to be focusing more right now on building out the mobile fleet of cars um, <clears throat> that come to you. And I've experienced that, by the way, which is excellent. Um, because let's face it, setting up a physical service center with uh, a lot of lifts has turned out to be, um, for them, uh, very expensive. And um, in most cases, you don't need to put a car in a lift. They can actually do most of the uh, the service right there in your driveway or work or whatever the case may be. So they've been seen. To, they they seem to be focusing more and more on uh, building the uh, the mobile fleet out, which is S's and X's. And I did see, and I don't have any pictures here, but I have seen some Model Threes that are starting to get the the red panel on the side door. So that indicates there's a possibility they may be used to some of the service cars too. We, we don't know yet, but um, there might be some evidence for that. So I feel for you, um, but like I said. Please, can you just keep trying? Uh, they will get back to you eventually. It's just early days. Um, so, yeah. Can, can I jump in with a quick hack on that? Uh, please Trev? do. You please know what I've yes. you know done? It sort of seems to short circuit the system a little better. Okay. Call from, call from the car. Mm. That's that's worked for me before. I did that with my car I rented from Turo in California when I was trying to get through the hell of getting my order figured out. I was staying on hold on my mobile forever. But when I called from the car, 
it was like they assumed you had some sort of emergency ah. or something, and it, it sort of piped me in. So try that. You might get lucky. Oh, okay. Well, good point. I'll try and remember that for me if I ever need it. Hopefully I don't need to. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully not. All right. Next question comes from Mark McKnight. He says, I'll be going to Florida in March. Should I change my winter tires to all season? Will it hurt the tires to drive them at a distance in the warmer climate? Thanks. Well, Ian, take the helm on this one because I know you have some other things to add into this. Go ahead. All right. Well, I could turn this into a two long, hour long dialogue. No, we don't have that kind of time. Promise not to do that. The short version of the story is uh, let's start with what type of winter tires are you using? If it's a high speed rated tire, which is what Tesla generally recommends for all of their cars, the Model 3 included, like when you buy the factory setup, they're, uh, they're V rated um, Pirelli Winter Soto Zeros. So those generally do quite well in warmer climates. Um, they react much more like a, an all-season performance tire. They're a little more resilient uh, at taking it abuse in, in warmer temperatures. I wouldn't have any qualms about that at all. So that's good. that's straight out of the way. No problem there. However, uh, like many of us who are in really extreme northern um, climates, if you have a lower speed rated tire, like a T or an H rated, that's going to offer better grip on ice and snow, that comes at a cost of giving up some performance on, on dry roads, and particularly as the weather warms up. So if you've got that type of a tire, uh, I would still vote that you leave them on, because uh, looking at the threat level, uh, you're going to have a much greater chance running into problems on ice or snow with the all season than you will running the snow tire in the warm weather. Uh, it's still not ideal, but it, to me, it's the lesser of the evils, you know, just don't hoon it too much around. You know, if you're anything like me, you'll have to ex exercise a great amount of restraint, not driving uh, the car to its limits because it's so much fun to drive. Um, so just take it easy. Um, don't abuse them. They'll, they'll be fine for a short period of time. Uh, particularly in wet weather, I find uh, a lot of the winter tires in warm, wet weather don't grip as well as the standard all season. This is kind of where they go upside down in the traction. But it's not dangerous. I mean, certainly it's way better than trying to, to run the all seasons um, on the, uh, in, in any kind of really cold ice and snow. And, and driving in March, I've done it many times back and forth from Florida. You can get slammed with some really nasty storms. I remember uh, having some all seasons on my A3 Quattro. Uh, going through the mountains in the 81 and it was like whiteout conditions and like I don't scare easily driving and I was petrified <laughs> it was really really scary like at some points you were diving into the corner like at 30 40 miles an hour on the interstate and I could feel the car going from the guardrails like please baby Jesus please baby Jesus please baby Jesus and it's like <laughs> okay she's coming back you know like no never never again I'd much rather stay on the winter mm, excellent um, speaking of which, there was this uh, picture that uh, was floating around. I posted it on Twitter. Um, someone went and got winter tires on. And, well, I'm going to assume they're winter tires. And, well, here's the picture here. Try not to freak out too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they put one of these weights, uh, typically what you see on steel tires, <clears throat> on the outside. Those are uh, aero rims, by the way. Uh, typically with the Teslas, they use the little stick-on weights that go on the inside of the rim. So this is a little unsightly. But Ian, you had an opinion about this, that this is not as bad as it seems, but it comes with its own set of issues. Yeah, this popped up on Twitter today, and I, I wanted to respond on it because it's um, maybe not well known, but actually... It's not uncommon for alloy wheels to have a clip-on weight, and the one you see in there is actually the correct design. You'll notice that the clip that goes around the rim flange is quite large, so that is definitely one that is designed for an alloy wheel. It's a proper um, plastic-coated one as well, so that means that there's no chance that it'll corrode or damage the finish, or it shouldn't anyway, on, on the alloy wheel. We see this a lot with OEM wheels where they're just looking for speed and, and precision, you know, on the production line, they'd rather use the clip-on style weight. So even though they look hideous, you know, especially on a silver painted wheel that's a silver weight, they sort of get away with it. Um, the problem doing this specifically on the aero wheel, of course, is that you expect the cover um, to snap back into place. I don't think it's going to be able to do that. <laughs> I, I think the problem... No, I, I think this is going to prevent the cover. Certainly no, guaranteed from it won't work. Guaranteed. Yeah, I, I don't see it at all because that's the point of that ridge is is you that uh, the, the cover is supposed to sit flush with that little lip that sticks out. You actually see that uh, protruding flange when the cover is in place. So there's there's no way this is going to allow the covers to go back on. So that's a no-no. So any on in the air of their wheels, you really should be running. Um, anybody really put stick-ons. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just, just use the stick-on weight. Specify to your shop that you want stick-on weights. I mean, 
it, it works just as well for all intents and purposes. Yes, you need a little bit more weight to make it work because uh, the weight is slightly closer to the center of the wheel. It requires more weight to achieve the same dynamic correction, but it works fine. And, and the, the nice thing is with most Teslas, they're not enormously sensitive to wheel balancing. I've had some VWs and Hondas where it's like, you know, you're out by a gram or two and you'd feel it in the car. These cars are, are a little bit more forgiving. So <laughs> a standard stick on works beautifully. By, by the way, don't be like our, our, our other friend, Ian, Mr. Uh, Red, Red Bar Tesla, <laughs> and put steel oh, yeah. laser in your Model 3. <laughs> no, <laughs> that is a crime against humanity. <laughs> I see steel. I, I want to call up the, oh yeah, no, no. That's I love my buddy Ian, but when I saw the steelies, I went, oh gosh. <laughs> no, I went screaming out of the room when I saw that. <laughs> All right, next question comes from uh, Hubert Savelberg. I'm going to assume that's how you pronounce your name. He says, uh, tow hitch possibility to mount a heavy e-bike at the back of the car. It will not be possible for me. He gives his age. I won't tell you what his age is. Um, he, want, uh, he doesn't want to lift the e-bike onto the roof. It's a no-go for me if it's not possible on the Model 3. Well, Hubert, I have the proper solution for you because even though Tesla does not make a hitch for the Model 3, you can indeed buy one. Here's the website. Torquelift Central, they make a Model 3 Stealth Eco Hitch and uh, sells for uh, $400 US. You can also buy this from our, uh, our, our good sponsors, EvanX, as well. And uh, it's fairly straightforward. It involves a little bit of work. I would recommend you get it professionally installed because they have to take the bumper fascia off and there's some electrical and stuff. But it is rated for 200 pounds of tongue weight and 2,000 pounds of towing weight. So it'll have the strength to keep up with... Um, with whatever you want to throw on it for the large, uh, for, for the most part. Um, you can get a hitch size of 1.25 or the 2-inch um, hitch receiver, which is fairly standard. And uh, But they don't mention if there's any electrical on this, but I'm assuming that since you want to put an e-bike on the back, you're probably just going to put a carrier or something like this in this picture here. This is a uh, uh, some kind of mountain bike on the back. And um, you can buy the other receivers here with these hitches that, that fold up. So there's your answer, Hubert. So it's not all is lost. You can certainly get a hitch for your... Uh, for your Model 3 without too much trouble. And uh, make sure you charge your car because as Trevor continues <laughs> having bikes oh. in the back of your electric vehicle, will certainly take some range off of your car. Well, at highway speeds. Uh, when I took my yes. trip out to uh, Vermont this past summer, we had two um, mountain bikes on the back. And uh, at highway speeds, uh, I would say it's 25 to 30% less range. It's like a great big parachute. I'm exaggerating, but it, it is mm -hmm. very draggy on there. In the city, eh, don't even notice it. But at highway speeds, yeah, yeah expect to see some range loss for sure. Okay, next mm -hmm. one comes from um, Anuj Dalal. He says, is range estimation done differently in Europe? 499 kilometers Ontario Canadian webpage. Saw 530 kilometers on the screenshot you posted earlier. Okay, yes, you have to understand. In Europe, they use a different uh, mechanism for uh, for weighting electric uh, vehicles. In the U.S. and North America, we use the EPA standard. In Europe, up until recently, they were using the NEDC, uh, which was hugely optimistic and completely um, yeah, unrealistic. So, that, <laughs> yes. So, that would explain the discrepancy in the kilometer ratings, but... Um, Real life kilometer rating on a long range Model 3 at 90% charge is what, about 418 kilometers, Ian? Something like that? Um, hard for me to judge because I, I haven't had mine in any kind of decent weather. And of course, I had the monster Yokohamas on it, which murdered range. That's a whole story under yeah, itself. Yeah. But um, I think it's in yeah. there, anyways. Remember yeah, the. It, Remember give, give, the, give or take. Yeah, no, remember the rating that Tesla gives you is at 100%, but you don't do 100% charge. Right? That's, right. So, you know, yeah, it's but 499, I, 310, yeah. 317 miles um, yeah. on a full charge at 100%. So, you know, at 90%, do the math. That's about yeah. right in there. So, yeah, ignore the European stuff. It's not 100% realistic. On the old NED standard, on the new one, it's a little bit more realistic. But the but the, the measurement cycle is different than EPA. EPA is much, much more realistic. So that's where the discrepancy is coming from. Okay, last question of the night comes from TH. Nothing more than that. Hello. <laughs> Why do so many vehicles, example, Toyota, Corolla, Subarus, etc., come with come stock with adaptive crews, but Tesla doesn't unless you spend $5,000 on an enhanced autopilot bundle? Is Tesla behind the times here? <laughs> no, they want your money. No, they want their money. It's all about profitability. I agree that, um, look, uh, adaptive cruise control is very prevalent on all kinds of cars. Man, you can get it on Kia. Kia is one of those companies that seems to take 
what are normally luxury features on higher end cars and they bring it down. Folding mm-hmm. mirrors, adaptive cruise control, these type of technologies, they're one of the first to actually bring it down to the common man, so to speak. And yes, I get this a lot. Um, keep in mind, it doesn't matter what Tesla you buy. If you don't buy enhanced autopilot, you get basic cruise control. But you also have to remember too that adaptive cruise control is still not common on every car out there. It's still right. usually a part of an option or something like that. In this case, Tesla is tying it to enhanced autopilot, which includes auto steer. And that is definitely not a technology you're going to find on most cars unless you spend right. big dollars on luxury mm-hmm. cars. So yeah. you have to put it in context. Uh, yes, Tesla options are not cheap. Uh, yes, I think some people would like to – I mean – I would love to be able to have it uh, on the car without having to pay extra. But once you experience auto steer and, and it's autopilot, it's just like, yeah, okay, I get it. So, no, I don't th- I don't think they're behind the times. It's just the way that they package things. And uh, Tesla, mm-hmm. as Ian said, they want money. And they're very good at pricing their options so that they get money. Yep. <sighs> I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I know it may be not the answer that you want to hear because everybody says I want everything for free, but this isn't uh, this isn't the way no, things I, are. I, I sympathize with that question. You know, I it's funny, and I'll I'll, I'll get stoned for saying this, but if they had offered adaptive just as like a thousand dollar option or something like that, oh, they get a lot of takers for that, sure. I yeah, because I, I got to tell you, I love the steering in this car so much that it's no it's no work at all to steer it even on long highway trips. That's what I especially on nicer winding roads like the interstates in California. I just love driving it. I almost never used AP. Uh, here I, I tend to enjoy it more because like, especially going on long straight trips, uh, it's, it's really nice to have the auto steer, but, uh, but yeah, I'm with them. That's, that's another thing that I'll put on my little wish list for three, four five years from now when they can start divvying up the options, maybe they'll be able to offer that just as a, as a, as a low cost option rather than tying it to uh, auto steer. Yeah. Enhanced autopilot, especially with the auto steer is something that I use all the time on long distance trips for round town. No. Nah. But when I'm on the highways and I have to go somewhere, yeah, I, I definitely use it. And I very much enjoy it, especially in the mornings when you get caught in traffic, man. Enhanced uh, or that traffic where cruise control is the bomb. <laughs> Being able to do all that stop yes. and go. It's just way less stress. Way, way less stress. I mean, I don't get road rage anymore. I was not oh. much for road rage, but there are times it's just like, okay, granny, let's go. Experience and it, it, could al- it could also be that it might be something that, if if it is in a pipeline idea, let's just say for again, we're just theorizing here for a moment. Mm-hmm. But let's just, let's just say that think of it like Microsoft Office for a PC. For a long time, you couldn't just get one of the applications. You'd have to get the suite of applications. Mm-hmm. It could be that because right now EAP is still in beta. That until they maybe have it as a full fledged non beta version, maybe they're kind of keeping everything sort of tightly knit together until it gets to the point where. They feel like it's regulatory approval, whatever the reasons are. They, they finally say, we're going to unleash uh, EAP. It's not beta. We're, we're good with it. You don't have to actually have your hands on the wheel for 30 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe then at that point, they go, okay, well, now we can actually take this one component and extract it out and sell it as a one-off uh, on your orders. Maybe they do that. Maybe they don't. But it's cer- certainly something plausible based on the way they've been doing things as of late. You bring up an excellent point, Eric. You know, that might be one of the, their, uh, their strategies here because obviously the best way to get autopilot miles up is to encourage people to buy it in the first place, right, with the full auto steer package. Mm-hmm. So being that, you know, it was super important for them to rack up their first billion miles, uh, if, they had, uh, if they had offered adaptive on its own, that would have cut out a lot of those miles. They might have of lost a lot of potential orders on the auto steer feature, which is what they really needed to, to get out there and get, you know, miles piled on. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope that answers your questions, guys. I think that's the end of the show for tonight. Um, Ian, oh. Oh, I know we could just keep going, but you know, we got to keep happy, you know, people are happy. <laughs> you got to get this thing out and I want to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is that. It's been a long day. I got a long day tomorrow too. Anyhow, uh, Ian, where can people find you if they want to chit chat with you on the internet? Uh, just give them all your contact stuff. Uh, Twitter is easiest, um, at Ian Pavelko. Um, Mr. Um, Page will be good enough to throw that up in the links there. Oh, you can find my, my handle there. Um, on Model 3 Owners Club, uh, Matt Hungarian is the handle. So um, any sort of questions you might have, but the ones you'll find me most useful, or have any use it at least, it would be on wheels and tires. And um, 
am I also have my little project on the side with the there we go Trev wearing right the weapons tonight, of baby. mass adoption shirt yes, there we sir. go yes so uh, yes if you go to teespring.com you can find uh, Matt Hungarian Evolve Wear and there's the uh, fundraiser shirt I've been doing since day one which is the evolution style shirt and then there's the new one the WMA weapons of mass adoption with the logo on the front and back there's mugs uh, there's lady shirts there's men's shirts all that good stuff excellent love your stuff buddy and I'm Thank seeing you. it more and more on people on the internet. Excellent. Uh, Eric, your turn. Where can people chit-chat with you if they want to contact you? Sure. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I have one of those uh, wonderful mugs that Ian just referenced WMA, uh, for the mass adoption. You guys are the best. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know what? You, you give us some swag. We'll gladly showcase it. Uh, so you guys can find me on Twitter. I want to thank all the new followers. You guys have been fantastic in growing my base. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you are new to the show and you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me at the handle ECFIX. That is E-C-F-I-X. Uh, keep it short and simple. And uh, if you guys can find me there, Always welcome to any questions you guys have, any comments about the show, uh, anything you want us to cover, do that. Uh, I'm also good for comic relief, these guys can tell you. <laughs> so it's uh, we're always looking forward to having new followers in the show. So thank you so much for tuning in. Well, thank you very much for joining us as usual. Um, if you want to follow me, my Twitter handle is Model 3 Owners. And, uh, you know, we run the forum, which is uh, going like crazy now that I want to welcome all the European people because it's just like it's crazy right now. Um, hey, if you happen, if you ha we have hey. sub forums. Listen, we have sub forums for every uh, most of the uh, geographical areas in Europe and stuff. So if you guys want to talk amongst yourself, just go into the forum and stuff. You'll see areas for, you know, Belgium and France and stuff like that. So you guys can uh, chit chat in there. So you're welcome to do that. Membership completely free just go hang out there and you'll find that at model3ownersclub.com want to say a big thank you to our sponsors evanex and uh fine lab and lastly doula band insurance those guys keep paying the bills and it's uh, really appreciated also our patreon sponsors uh the guys really keep things going i really appreciate that and um oh one more thing if you want um there's still a little bit of time if you want to play say model 3 now of course you cannot get the federal tax credit anymore necessarily uh, through an order but if you're looking for a model 3 and you want the six months of free supercharging you can use any one of our referral codes they're down in the uh, video the podcast description you can check those out if you are panicking and maybe you'd like to get something uh, towards the end of the year to maybe even qualify uh, call a local tesla showroom they may have some inventory of canceled orders they might be able to slip in so you still have a little bit of a window if you really want to with that yeah I'm inventory inventory orders typically deliver within two weeks yeah. so if you are looking the, for the tax credit you could still do it if you order in the next week or so excellent good point so there you go that's the end of the show and uh thanks for everybody for listening watching there happen you be out there and uh we'll catch you on the next one good night and we'll see you later bonsoir hey that's my line all right then good night <laughs> see you guys <laughs>